at least check it out. So I began the, the Rite of Christian Initiation, the Christian Nation process. And I went through the process. I had a great spiritual director at the time, Father Sam Palmer, who we had some great discussions, sometimes some hard discussions. But he truly led me to the church. I joined the church um, that Easter 30 years ago. So this last Easter, I celebrated 30 years, 1994. Once I joined the church, I got uber involved. I was parish council, I was finance council, I was, if you could think of a group, I was part of it. Knights, holy name. And it didn't dawn on me until I went through Christ Renews His Parish, where you kind of grab that Holy Spirit and I realized I had become a doer, not a participant in our church. So once I realized that, I started to participate in the Eucharist. I started to participate in the Mass. Not that I wasn't still a doer, but it took me a while to figure that out. And then I had a good friend one day we're having an adult beverage on the deck and he says Jim you'd make a good deacon and my response to him was what's a deacon because we had a couple of deacons at St. Pius but they weren't very involved I didn't really know them. I didn't know what they did so that kind of got tables but you know kind of being that we were involved we were involved in a couple of the ministries. I got to know another deacon at another church. And we're talking one day, and this is years apart. And he says, Jim, why don't you think about being a deacon? And that planted the seed. So I started to discern about what it meant to be a deacon. And as I discerned a while and talked with Mary, we discerned that let's give her a try. We were at a place in our life that made sense. So I applied to formation. Um, we were accepted. We went through four years of formation. And in 2010, I was ordained by Bishop Pates, to the surprise of many. <laughs> My calling came out of the mouth of an eight-year-old. It was nurtured by the Holy Spirit at the time, if you would have told me 25 years ago that you'd be a deacon or you'd be the director of the diaconate, I would have looked at you with a blank look. Not a chance. This is my story. As we reflect on the video and my story, our calling, whether we're called as husband, wife, deacon, priest, religious, whatever that might be, we need to identify where those callings come from and why they're important in somebody else's life. So what is a deacon? What is the permanent deacon? I'm going to give you a little history about it, kind of where it came from, how far back it goes, and then talk a little bit about our deaconate program as it is in place today. I think it's safe to say that deacons remain a bit of a, minister, a mystery to many Catholics. Maybe not so much with us in this room, but many of our Catholic brothers and sisters are unfamiliar with the permanent diaconate. The growth in the numbers of the permanent diaconate is pretty recent. All of the growth has been in the decades following the Second Vatican Council. Their decision to introduce the diaconate as a proper and permanent rank in the hierarchy of the church. So really about 60 years. Since the reintroduction of the diaconate, it has grown to a community of over 50,000 deacons worldwide, with about 97% of those being within Europe and the United States. The United States is reported that they have almost 21,000 deacons. 14,000 of those are active, the rest are retired. 
So we're starting to get old. Um, our oldest deacon was ordained 52 years ago. So you think about that. We're getting old. Deacons don't always fit into the church's categories that many of us grew up with. Imagine that. Deacons are seen assisting at mass, ministering to the most vulnerable, the sick, the poor. They're working at their day job, or you might see them at dinner with their wives, or at the supermarket with their families. The questions come up sometimes. Are they glorified older boys? Are they junior priests? Or are some form of religious brothers? And is, if we look at our Protestant brothers and sisters, their definition of deacon is way different than ours. Something I hear a lot is that, are they clergy? Are they laity? Are they some kind of a hybrid? And really the hybrid definition is not a bad definition. Because as we stand as Christ the servant, we stand kind of straddling the fence. We are one foot in the church and one foot in the secular or in the workplace. So we really are a little different. We have the ability to minister to others in the workplace that sometimes a priest can because we're, we're there on a different level. Like Bishop Johnson and Cardinal Collins and all the priests that will be here this weekend, deacons are members of the clergy who receive the sacrament of holy orders. But the permanent deacon is ordained unto sacred service as Christ the servant, not unto the priesthood. The Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us that the deacons uniquely participate in Christ's mission and grace through the sacrament of holy orders, which imprints a permanent character aligning them with the Christ as the servant. Where the priest is persona Christi, the head, the deacon is persona Christi, the servant. We are ordained to serve. In the context of the church's public worship, because of its centrality to the life of the believing community, the ministry of the deacon is uniquely concentrated and integrated in the threefold diaconia. Diaconia is service of the word, of the liturgy, and of charity. Strengthened by sacramental grace, deacons are dedicated to the people of God in conjunction with the bishop and his body of priests in that threefold ministry of charity word and liturgy. In the ministry of charity, the deacon brings the poor to the church and the church to the poor. He articulates the church's concern for justice by being a driving force in addressing injustices among God's people. You'll see the deacon visiting the sick, the homebound, the jails, the prisons, assisting the elderly, he is the eyes and the ears of the bishop out in the world. We actually work for the bishop in partnership with our priests. In the ministry of the word, the deacon's ministry begins at the altar and returns to the altar. The sacrificial love of Christ celebrated the Eucharist nourishes him and motivates him to lay down his life behalf of God's people. We'll see them proclaiming the gospel, preaching homilies, scripture study, baptism, marriage prep, living the gospel every day of their lives, evangelizing through personal witness of how they live that gospel. In the ministry of liturgy, in a unique way, 
It represents the integral re relationship between the worship of God in the liturgy that recalls Jesus Christ's redemptive suffering and the worship of God in everyday life where Jesus Christ is encountered. You might see the deacons assisting bishops and priests in liturgical celebrations, particularly in the Mass, distributing Holy Communion, aiding in marriage ceremonies, proclaiming the Gospel, and preaching, overseeing funerals, engaging in various charitable ministries. I would offer that if you can think of a ministry that is needed someplace, there's probably a deacon someplace in the world that is doing it. We are truly our servants doing the work of God. So where does all this come from? You know, I mentioned a little bit ago that uh, the Second Vatican Council restored the diaconate to its permanent place within the hierarchy of the church. However, it roots stretches back much further in our church's history to the apostolic times. In the first generation of the church, the Holy Spirit led the apostles to select seven men as deacons who would free the bishops of their more secular and temporal duties. We hear in the Acts of the Apostles. So the twelve called together in the community of disciples and said, It is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve a table. Brothers, select from among you seven reputable men filled with the spirit and wisdom who we shall appoint to this task where we shall devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. The proposal was accepted to the whole community, so they chose Stephen, a man filled with faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Proprius, Nicanor, Timon, Hermes, and Nicholas of Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. The first seven deacons were instituted to assist the apostles in the mission of their church. Little is known about those seven men. Stephen, we know, boldly proclaimed the gospel and was the first martyr of the church. He was stoned to death for what he said. Philip was known as an evangelist. He catechized and baptized throughout the land. The other deacons went out to preach and teach and heal and take care of the widows. In his letter to St. Timothy, St. Paul describes the qualities of a deacon. He says they're expected to exhibit seriousness, honesty, moderation, and alcohol, and alcohol consumption, and not to be driven by greed. They must faithfully uphold the mysteries of the faith with a clear conscience. Those that are married should be faithful to one spouse and manage their families responsibly. These are the qualities that we look for in our deacons yet today. When we interview, when we do all the background checks, we're looking for these qualities in our men today. Later during the patristic period, deacons became the bishop's right-hand man, often giving them the responsibility of financial management, along with the distribution of food and alms to the poor. St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote around 108, all should respect the deacon as Jesus Christ, just as all should recall the bishop as the image of the Father and the clergy as God's Senate and the College of the Apostles. Without these three orders, you cannot begin to speak of a church. By the early Middle Ages, the importance of the diaconate grew, especially in Rome. Of the 37 men that we elected to Pope between 432 and 654 AD, only three of them had been priests. The 34 had been deacons. And if you think of that, the deacon was the right hand of the bishop. So who made sense that would leave the church? The guy that knew it. Despite this influence in the 8th century, 
someplace during the 8th century, the diaconate shifted from the permanent diaconate to the transitional order, being a preparation stage for the priesthood. The permanent diaconate faded away. So where does the current permanent diaconate come from? During the Second World War, the restoration was discussed at the largest religious community in Europe, the concentration camp at Dachau, the death camp. There the priests speculated that the church would, what it would be like after the war if a married diaconate was restored. They knew there would be struggles because of the lack of priests. These, <clears throat> these discussions were written down and circulated after the war, eventually finding their way into the theological journals of the time. The question of restoration of the diaconate was posed to Pope Pius XII in 1957, who remarked, the idea at last at least for today, it's not ripe. We're not ripe. Shortly thereafter, a few years, on September 29, 1964, the idea ripened. In four separate votes during the Vatican Council, the Fathers approved the restoration of the diaconate as a permanent order in its own right, a full part of the threefold hierarchy of holy orders, bishop, priest, and deacon. On June 18, 1967, <clears throat> Pope Paul VI issued a document that reestablished the general norms for restoring the permanent diaconate for the Western Church. We still use these norms today. They've been highly modified, but the, the norms that uh, Paul VI wrote are still very much in play. The first deacon in the United States was ordained by Bishop Fulton Sheen in 1969. Following the directions of the Second Vatican Council, the Diocese of Des Moines established the permanent diaconate beginning the formation in 1970, with the ordination of its first nine permanent deacons in 1972. Since then, we have ordained 16 communities and have our 17th in formation today. Our claim to fame, October 4th, 1979, St. John Paul II, then Pope John Paul II, visited the Living History Farms, which is actually in my parish in St. Paul's. We, we claim that too. But the two men standing next to the Pope in the brown dramatic are two of our deacons. One was Lori Notek from our first cohort, and the other is Bob Hall from our second cohort. When the deacons were introduced to the Pope after the Mass, it's claimed that he looked at them and said, so, these are deacons. We're not sure where the inflection was. <laughs> but if you think about it, the diaconate was pretty new. He wasn't used to permanent deacons. This was something new for the Pope. So that's our claim to fame. Currently, we have 59 active deacons. We have 50 retired deacons. And by retired, some are still active in their ministry on a, on a lesser scale. Some have retired and are doing nothing. We have 20 men eligible to retire by 2028. So a third of our diaconate is eligible for retirement, really, today. I am one of them. The bishop won't let me, but I'm one of them. <laughs> we have 80 parishes in the Des Moines Diocese. We have 39 with deacons, 41 without. We are really pretty metrocentric. Most of our deacons are either in the Des Moines area or in the Council Bluffs area. We have a few smattered out in the, in the rural communities, which is really part of our recruitment, the, our plan going forward, 
is how do we recruit into those rural communities? How do we want, willing to bring those men into formation? We have, we stopped, we paused, and looked at our formation, and really we've totally redesigned it. We've gone to a virtual platform so we can reach out to the men in the rural areas and they can, in their homes, they can do their studies. The men that work long hours, our Hispanic brothers and sisters, they can do they can do their formation when they can in their homes. Now it's still a lot. It's five years of formation, but we're looking at different ways. How can we bring new life into our diaconate? That's where you all come in. As you're as you're recruiting, remember the diaconate. The, the, the vision of Vatican II was for the diagonal to be a young man's, so that 40-year-old, that was the age group they targeted. What's happened is we've become an old guys club. Most of our guys are in their 50s and 60s. You know, they're, they're kind of into their careers, they're thinking, you know, what do I want to do next? They're established, their kids are grown. The idea, our hope is that we could grow the younger guys, that their kids are still babies maybe, and we can recruit and use them for many, many, many years. So that's where we're at today. Our current cohort, cohort 17, we have 19 aspirants, men aspiring to the diaconate. 18 of those are couples, one is a widower. The average age of these men is 48.5 years. We have two couples from the Council Bluffs area, one couple from Leon and one couple from Harlan. So still a very small representation from our rural communities. 15 couples from Des Moines and surrounding area, from the Metro. They are, they just started in September, they started their second year of formation, so they have four years to go the five-year process. Our future formation, Bishop Johnson has allowed us and encouraged us to start a second cohort. We've never done that. We've always done four years start a cohort, four years start a cohort. So we're gonna have congruent cohorts running. Uh, they'll be three years apart. But the, the next call will come in fall of 2025 the admissions and scrutiny phase will take about a year from, from those fall dates into March, probably through to July, and then they will start formation in September of 26, with their ordination being September of 2031. As I mentioned, it's a five-year process. Two years is aspirancy. They're aspiring for formation, they're aspiring for the diaconate, and then they have three years of candidacy. It's when we torture them. It's when they get all the practicums and all the, they, they would think we're torturing them today, but we, we throw a lot more at them once they get the candidacy. Um, so our, our hope, and we've started, we've started to recruit for this next class. One thing we've done is we've started We've called it the St. Lawrence dinner. We've patterned it after the St. Andrew dinners. And we've had one so far, which we had nine men that showed up. We've got another one scheduled next month in the western part of the state. So we're hoping that as we plant the seed, that call will be heard and those men will discern. So we'll see where it goes.